Athenaeum, which is the public library on Nantucket Island in Massachusetts. And I'd like to thank you all for joining us and welcome. Um, if you look at the bottom of the screen, you'll see that there's a chat button and a Q&A button. You're welcome at any point to put questions in either one and we'll keep an eye on them and make sure that Charlie and Sean get them. And then at the end of the presentation, um, they will be taking questions from you all. So you can put them in as we go, or you can save them up and put them in at the end. And I'm just gonna say a few words by way of introduction about our speakers tonight. And then I'm gonna turn off my camera and let them take it away. So Sean Latham is director of the Tulsa University Institute for Bob Dylan Studies. And he's also the Oklahoma Center for the Humanities director. His teaching and research focus on modern literature and culture with a particular focus on major figures like James Joyce and Bob Dylan. He's the author or editor of nine books and has edited this year's anthology, The World of Bob Dylan, which came out just ahead of Dylan's 80th birthday in May. Charlie Walters albums review, album reviews have appeared in Rolling Stone magazine and on Nantucket, he owned and operated the music hall store for many years. Recently, he's taught courses for the Athenaeum on the history of several musical genres, including the blues, folk music, and rock and roll. And he hosts the weekly radio show, Island Blue Notes on WACK. So please join me in welcoming Sean Latham and Charlie Walters and take it away. Great, thank you very much. Uh, I appreciate that introduction, Amy, and it's a great pleasure to be here. Charlie, it's a great pleasure to be here with you as well. I Look forward to our to our conversation this afternoon. I, uh, as I was saying before we joined here, I'm coming to you from Tulsa, Oklahoma, which is uh, the home, among other things, of the Bob Dylan Archive and the home of the Bob Dylan Institute, uh, which, as Amy said, I direct. Um, but I spent a lot of time in New England. I went to graduate school there, and uh, my wife and I lived for ten years in Rhode Island, uh, at, right on the ocean, in fact. And uh, I think she's now twenty years later, maybe forgiven me for moving us as far away from the ocean as we can probably be and still be in the continental United States. Uh, but uh, but I certainly wish I could be joining you in person on Nantucket. It's a beautiful place and a uh, place I've had a chance to visit and look forward to having the opportunity to visit again in the future. So uh, I thought we'd get started by just giving you at least, at least a little bit of an overview at Charlie's suggestion of The World of Bob Dylan, which is the book that I've edited and posed beautifully in the background uh, behind me, attractively priced at booksellers everywhere. Um, and uh, and Amy's put a link in the in the chat there, I see. Uh, and so really the idea for this book grew up because of the acquisition of the Bob Dylan Archive here in Tulsa. So I'll give you just a little bit of a, a background about that as well, so you have some sense of, of basically what's happened, which is approximately three years ago, uh, a, a nonprofit organization here in Tulsa uh, called the George Kaiser Family Foundation acquired the Bob Dylan Archive. This group had already acquired the Woody Guthrie Archive and moved that archive here. Uh, Guthrie, of course, is from Oklahoma, not too far from Tulsa. Uh, and so in some sense, this was bringing Guthrie back home. So all of Woody Guthrie's papers and archives are housed here in the Woody Guthrie Center, which is also a museum-like experience that will introduce you to Guthrie's life and to the Oklahoma Dust Bowl and, uh, and the sort of cultural and musical influences that helped create Guthrie and that Guthrie in turn helped himself to create. Uh, and so alongside that, they then acquired the Bob Dylan Archive, obviously a much bigger acquisition. It was a huge moment when it happened. Uh, and it, it is an enormous archive. I don't think anyone quite knew that Dylan had been doing this, uh, but it turns out Dylan was something of a pack rat, uh, had been hoarding at least since about probably 1965, uh, 1964, 1965, basically when he began to settle down at least a little bit every scrap of paper apparently that he was writing songs on or typing lyrics on, hotel note sheets that he was drafting lyrics on, uh, you know, newspaper, I mean, sorry, typewriter uh, sheets that he was typing up lyrics on, just an enormous collection of paper of all of this creativity, creative energy that was flowing out of Dylan and onto paper. Uh, and so the archive itself contains uh, it's actually a little bit difficult to count for a variety of reasons, but a, a good number is approximately 100,000 objects within the Bob Dylan archive that include paper materials, they include uh, recorded materials uh, like uh, uh, 
you know, session tapes, many of which are, are being slowly released as part of the Bob Dylan art, uh, bootleg in series, the official bootleg series um, that Dylan's management company produces. Uh, we also have stems for many of those recording sessions. So you can go in and listen to just the drum stems that were taking place around like a Rolling Stone, for example. Uh, lots and lots of film footage uh, of Dylan in concert, as well as the films that Dylan himself helped to make and to film. Uh, and of course, lots of photographic stuff for album covers and posters and promotional shots and uh, and then lots of correspondence between Dylan and uh, and his cohorts as well. So there's an amazing sort of collection of material here. And once that material arrived, uh, we knew we needed to build some kind of scholarly apparatus around it. This is clearly a major figure. At the time, Dylan had not yet won the Nobel Prize in Literature. Uh, he actually won that not long after we acquired the archive, which made us look like absolute geniuses, uh, even though it was more luck than than skill. Uh, and uh, and the George Kaiser Family Foundation is in the process now of building the Bob Dylan Center here in Tulsa, which will be housed next door to the Woody Guthrie Center, and will also provide a kind of museum-like experience of Dylan's life and career and influences. Uh, and so as a, as a process of figuring out what do you do with an archive, you know, uh, what kinds of questions will it allow us to ask? How do we make sense of Dylan now no longer as just as just a popular music figure that has a huge fandom around him, but clearly is an object of ongoing scholarly interest as, you know, in the words of the Nobel Committee, sort of one of the, you know, a, a great contributor to world literary culture uh, in the folk tradition, as the committee put it. Uh, you know, what do you do with that? And so we decided to put together as one of our first, uh, as one of our first projects, a book called The World of Bob Dylan. And it's basically an attempt to take as prismatic a look at Dylan's life as we possibly can. It contains 27 different chapters um, each of which is designed to provide a different person's sort of view of Dylan's career uh, and work and influence in politics based on, on different areas of expertise. One of the fascinating things about Dylan is that there's no one way to get into his work, right? This is a guy that wrote country songs and gospel songs, rock songs and folk songs, Americana songs. Uh, he was deeply involved in the civil rights movement. Uh, he constantly reinvents his own music and, and himself. Uh, his work has been the basis of, of work by philosophers, by marketing professors, by literature professors like me, by musicologists. So there's no one easy or right way to really get at Dylan. And so what we wanted to do with a book like this is bring together, in this case, 25 different contributors from all kinds of different fields to say, how does Dylan look to you? And to then give the reader this kind of prismatic uh, look at Dylan. Um, so you can see there's never going to be just one way to look at him or one right way to look at him. Um, so the book looks at all of the musical genres, for example, that Dylan's explored. It looks at questions of justice. There's an essay in there by a, a marketing professor about Dylan's brand. Uh, there's There are essays in the book about the biographies that have been written about uh, Dylan, uh, essays about Dylan's religious life, uh, famously sort of, you know, Dylan himself uh, was raised as a, as a, in a secular Jewish household um, and famously converted to Christianity in the middle of his career and uh, caused all kinds of controversy when he did so. Uh, there are essays in there about Dylan and gender, for example. So one of the great essays, I think, in the volume is by a woman named Ann Powers, who's NPR's music critic, who writes about the ways in which Dylan has inhabited his body over his long career and especially the ways in which it's shaped a sort of understanding of, of rock star masculinity because Dylan is is not your sort of classic looking rock star by any stretch. Uh, and so she talks about the various transformations of his body throughout his career. Um, so 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 the book itself is meant to, as, as the title suggests, provide a look at the whole world of Bob Dylan, that this is a guy that's not just one figure, but a figure through, through whom so much of 20th century culture flows and intersects. And then from whom all kinds of channels of creativity and social action uh, and philosophy and critical inquiry then move out. Uh, and I can give you just one anecdote here that might be amusing uh, about why I think Dylan might be so important and why something like World of Bob Dylan might be so useful a term for us to use. Uh, I was doing an interview with with uh, for the book with, with a, a pretty distinguished British uh, journalist uh, who was a bit skeptical about Dylan, uh, a fan, but was sort of trying to get me to say, did he really deserve the Nobel Prize? Is he really a great literary figure? And I sort of gave him a, a shortened version of some of the things I've just said here uh, about why I think Dylan is so important uh, as a cultural and historical figure. And he said, oh, 
Well, I suppose you have to think that way. Dylan, after all, has been around for about a third of your entire national history. So you probably have to think of a figure like that as somehow being uh, important. You know, we have Shakespeare, we have a longer view. Uh, so I totally got my hackles up. Uh, I wasn't gonna put up with this British snobbery uh, about you know American culture, but on reflection, I think that was actually absolutely right. It is extraordinary. Dylan's now lived through, through 80 years and made music through 60 of those 80 years. Uh, and it has given him an enormous view of American life, of American history, of some of the most consequential changes that have taken place in American history. And Dylan's been there to record it musically and creatively, um, you know, across this extraordinary historical reach. And in some sense, I think ultimately, though, uh, though I wanted to quarrel uh, about it at the time, I, I, I think in some ways that observation by the, the British journalist was correct, that it's, it's the sheer scope of Dylan's career and the fact that he's remained so creative and so intense uh, as a as a musician throughout it uh, that makes him worthwhile uh, for and and deserving of this kind of you know the kind of treatment that somebody like me a scholar can can bring to it so Charlie I don't know if that gives you a way to sort of uh, I don't know what your view of Dylan is and whether or not you think he's he stacks up as as that kind of figure or not well let, let's investigate that uh, first of all uh, thanks Sean for doing this I, I'm happy to meet you even though it's just virtually but it's far better than nothing. And thank you, Amy, for putting this together with the Athenaeum. Um, there are hundreds of titles out there about Dylan, one aspect or you know, biography or whatever. And I've read some of them. I've read your book. And I would say anyone who wants to seriously investigate Bob Dylan, your book is a good place to start, precisely, precisely because it has 27 chapters looking at Dylan from every possible angle. Um, Dylan and theater, for example, that most of that was a total surprise to me. <laughs> but you know, you, the author went into great depth on that. Uh, Dylan is fascinating for so many reasons. You know, as you point out, he's been recording for about sixty years. He's put out who knows how many dozen albums by this time. People have dug back into the archives and, and put out the bootleg series, things that had not come out originally when they were recorded. He's done so many different kinds of music. He has uh, shifted gears so many times. And I come away thinking, you know, here's someone who has done some great music without question. But I think most people would agree that not all of his albums have hit the mark. And aside from the, the great music he's put out, what, what sticks with me is how mysterious Bob Dylan is. I think that's that's due to many things. I think he's to start with a mysterious guy anyway, because he has so many varied interests and he brings all this, these interests and his knowledge into his music. But also to some degree, I think he he doesn't discourage the mystery. And he'll do some things that I, I still wonder about, you know, how when he recorded Self Portrait, for example, um, what was he thinking? Uh, or as, as Greil Marcus said in his Rolling Stone review, what is this blank? And I think all Dylan fans were wondering the same thing when that came out. And he later said, well, it was just a joke. But he's also said things, he said at one point to an interviewer that he had mixed up Smokey Robinson and Arthur Rambeau. <laughs> Do we take him at his word for that? I don't know. I'm, I'm inclined to say, no, we don't take him at his word. Um, but but who knows with Dylan? And it's it's the quantity of what he's put out, but also um, the depth of what he's put out. He does have a sense of humor, without question. He has from his first album. Um, I think that often gets that gets left behind because there's so much serious stuff out there. But he he is a multi-layered artist, and uh, you know I think you know, 80 years from now, people are still going to be studying Dylan very closely. Yeah, I, th I mean, I, th I think that that makes a ton of sense to me. The uh, I, Dylan's interesting as a musician. Uh, he's he's interesting, I, I think, as a performer in the sense. So Dylan's a great songwriter, right? That's a lot of what we see in the archive. This is D Dylan. Dylan is a songwriter. Dylan as a performer is a bit different than Dylan as a songwriter. Uh, among other things, I think one of the extraordinary things about Dylan, and this goes, I think, to what, part of what you're saying about his mysteriousness. Charlie, is a, he's a guy that basically early on said, I don't ever want to become the fat Elvis. That is, 
I don't ever want to be the guy that goes to Vegas in my middle age or late middle age and has a stage at a casino and plays the same hits and the same songs in the same way night after night for a rotating crowd of people that are there to just hear what they heard on the radio in, in, in 1966. And so he's dedicated himself to an almost relentless, sometimes even seemingly self-destructive process of reinvention. Uh, that he's he's never going to do the same thing twice. And as, as you know, and if you've ever been to a Dylan concert, it's, an, it's, a, it's often an incredibly unsettling experience because he doesn't perform the songs at all the way that you might have heard them on the album. And it can take you minutes to get through a song before you actually realize he's playing like a Rolling Stone, but it's with a surf rock boogie or it's, it's, re, it's reconfigured as if it came out of the American songbook. Uh, and you just did, can't even quite understand that that's the song Dylan's got. And so he sees every song, I think, as a as a thing to keep making and remaking. It's like clay almost that he's he's constantly shaping in the performance. Sometimes it ends up making a kind of mess on the stage and you're like, well, that was I was unlucky. Right. He tried and, and it didn't work. And some nights you're there and you you see the sort of creative process on the stage happen and you have a sense of Dylan understanding himself, I think as a performer is being in a theatrical space. He's taking risks. You know, he does it night after night because he's not going to repeat himself. And to me, that's it's not just mysterious. It's it's incredibly brave uh, to do that. J Dylan could have made many, many safer choices throughout the course of his career. I think still been a towering genius as a songwriter, but ultimately less interesting because there would be somewhat less there for us to, to mull over. Uh, you're right. He has done that a lot taking old songs or not so old songs and rearranging them completely. And I don't know of anyone else who's done it to such an extent as Dylan. Of course, Dylan has been around longer than most people <laughs> as a recording artist. But I can remember, um, well, the song Masters of War uh, from his protest period, if you want to call it that, his second album. And it's just, you know, Dylan and, and the guitar. And at the Grammys about 30 years ago, he came out and sang a song. And as you say, I had no idea what the song was for a while. Well, it was Masters of War. And he had completely rearranged it. He had picked up the tempo a lot. He had gotten rid of the melody. It was almost like a punk rock song. And I thought, well, you know, what's he doing here? Well, you know, maybe it was because war in the Middle East was going on. But who knows? That, that's, again, going back to this mysterious aspect of Dylan, who really knows what he's up to? Um, I'm not sure he always knows what he's up to, actually. But I, I think Dylan, more than a lot of other artists, he thinks that if you're going to be a musician, that's what you do. You perform all the time. You know, he's been on the so-called never-ending tour for 30 years. He puts out albums almost every year and has done that for 60 years. He's done standards. He's done self-portrait, you know, as, as you pointed out. He's done country. He's done this. He's done that. Um, he's recorded albums with seemingly no producer, at least no producer listed on the, uh, on the jacket notes. And they sound unproduced in many cases. And yet he's also worked with people like Daniel Lanois, who has worked with U2, of, of all people. Um, he's been both very careful and very careless about, about his music. Uh, even down to his album covers. I mean, some of the album covers look as if they were designed in three minutes by somebody who knew nothing about graphic design. But he's, he, to me, he feels that his job is to perform and to record, even if he goes in and records in one day, wants to do it as fast as he can, at least he's out there doing it. And that, you know, that's another thing. He never, back in the 60s, when other bands were spending literally hundreds of hours, hundreds of hours in the studio. Dylan didn't do that. I mean, the same year the Beatles put out Sgt. Pepper, he put out John Wesley Harding, which took, what, two or three days to record? He didn't go in for that, you know, take 10, take 20, take 30, you know, let's overdub the violins, so let's over. There wasn't any of that stuff at all with him. He just went in and did it and got out and probably got back on the road again to, to do another show. Yeah, John, I mean, John Wesley Harding is, is an amazing album for exactly that reason, right? That Dylan had sort of, especially up through Blonde on Blonde, just before he had the motorcycle accident, he was sort of leading the way in this kind of almost psychedelic, you know, wildly inventive lyrical kind of rock. Uh, has this motorcycle accident, 
the Beatles, everybody want to start copying what Dylan's done. Uh, and then he emerges from Woodstock to go to the studio and produces John Wesley Harding, which is incredibly pared down. It's basically Dylan and a guitar and a bass and a little bit of harmonica. And that's, it's like antithetical to everything it, he'd been doing. It blew everyone's mind. And to me, what, what really stands out about, about what you're describing, Charlie, is, is I guess my view of Dylan, which is Dylan is a musical historian. This is a guy who's not only constantly trying to, to make music and perform music, but the music matters to me and it becomes really important. And I think this is why Dylan wins a Nobel prize, for example, in the, in a way that most other musicians probably wouldn't because Dylan is a, is an, in his own way, a, an incredibly rigorous historian of American popular music and its various traditions. So, and you can almost see this pattern over the course of Dylan's career is that, that as he gets, as he creates what we think of as an amazing album of rock or country or, uh, or folk music, he then sort of retires or withdraws for a moment, starts listening to entirely different stuff and then emerges to transform that genre through his own careful study and, and integration of the of the old material. So you see this, for example, most notably, I mean, the, the famous moment when this happens is, is in Woodstock, where he, he goes into Woodstock as a Ray-Ban wearing rock star who's carrying, you know, wearing these polka dot shirts and carrying around a light bulb and taunting every, every, uh, every journalist that tries to ask him a question. And it's just a sort of the, the ultimate, the ultimate in cool is, is, is the Dylan of 1966. He comes out of Woodstock as a kind of country gentleman. He becomes really close friends with Johnny Cash is recording in Nashville, uh, you know, with the cats and has clearly spent his time in Woodstock. And we, we actually see this. So in, in the Dylan archives, there are these amazing collection of tiny notebooks where Dylan's keeping track of the things that he's listening to, of, of lyrics that he's developing. And what you hear there is Dylan working with his with some of the members of the band that are living there in Woodstock as well, in the, you know, working in the Big Pink, uh, and just digging their way through American history, through sea shanties and old slave ballads and uh, traditional murder ballads, country songs, seagoing songs. It's just an amazing collection of stuff. Clearly Dylan's listening to. They're teaching each other. We now hear these on the bootleg albums that came out of the, the Woodstock era. And he emerges from that with, with John Wesley Harding and Nashville Skyline and this kind of renewed sense of what the American music tradition might, might look like. And it's in some ways almost a rebuke to the Beatles and the British invasion, right? Dylan's gone back and said, here's this other history that also informs American music. You guys have been studying the blues as I taught you to do basically in my folk and rock days. And now I'm going to put you in a different direction. You see the same thing around the Christian era. Dylan's clearly gone back and started listening to gospel music, right? A guy that who's built a lot of his music around the blues, a music that's often about black suffering and black deprivation. And he discovers this whole other history of black music in America that's about uplift, that's about choral singing, that's about women's voices being powerfully integrated with men's voices. Dylan learns a lot about women performance, I mean, a, a lot about gospel from listening to women perform in particular and, and begins performing with women on stage. And we see the same thing then with albums like Love and Theft that come up after the really low point of the 80s for Dylan's career. He releases these two albums of, that are just folk covers um, of some of his favorite songs, World Gone Wrong, for example, uh, and emerges from the other side, basically inventing what we now think of as the Americana genre. So, and to, again, what you hear in each of these to me is Dylan the historian, Dylan the guy that's digging back into the past to see what's useful, what can we pull forward. And every time he does that, Right, it's like wonders unfold in our ears and in our imaginations. Well, you're right about Americana. I mean, he is the personification of uh, Americana, what's come to be called Americana music. And it's, it, it's interesting to follow the twists and turns that he's taken. He, the music he made before he went to Woodstock in the late 60s was Blonde on Blonde, which was this you know, lyrical extravaganza of many layers. The basement tapes, which didn't come out until years later, are not like that at all. I mean, Dylan's humor comes out more. It's more, um, uh, it's more intimate music. You know, he doesn't have a, a room full of studio musicians in Nashville. They're in the basement, literally, in, in upstate New York. But then when he comes out with John Wesley Harding, as you say, he's pared it down even more. 
and Nashville Skyline is paring it down in a different way. But if you go before that, his, his third album, and this is before he went electric, his third album was Times They Are A-Changing, which was the most topical, the most protest-oriented album he made. The album after that, which was again an acoustic album, another side of Bob Dylan, it's really a pop album, but played on an acoustic guitar and a harmonica. And, and the folk community was outraged by that because they caught on immediately and said, you know, these, these aren't folk songs, these are pop songs. What do you think you're doing? And to have that come right after all the protest songs, I think it was Dylan's way of saying, well, you think you know me? Well, you don't. And here I'm gonna show you why. It's as if he's always trying to keep one step ahead of everybody. I think he wanted to be a, a big star and he wanted to be taken mm -hmm. seriously. And yet when people started to follow him a lot, uh, he got uncomfortable with it. So he's been, he's been constantly shedding skin. Then in the, I think it was in the eighties, he had been making a lot of electric albums. And then all of a sudden he made two acoustic albums, you know, Good As I've Been To You and World Gone Wrong. And the, the first one of those albums and somebody correct me if I'm wrong. I think he makes a mistake on the guitar in the first two seconds, but he doesn't stop playing. He doesn't re-record it. They put it on the album and it's the very first song on the album. Is Dylan trying to make a statement by saying, look, I'm not God, I can make a mistake too. And I'll put it on the first song in the first, on the beginning <laughs> of the album. I don't know, but you make a good point about he's always changing directions. And that's one of the reasons that we're so interested in it. Yeah, I mean, as I said, to me, he feels a bit like an encyclopedia of American popular music. And I mean, I'll even go back and say the album that, as you said, Greil Marcus sort of ran down. And Greil, of course, did subsequently totally revise his opinion of self-portrait. I misunderstood uh, at the time because in, in those Woodstock notebooks that I was talking about, one of the things I found is the lists of song candidate songs Dylan was generating to put on self-portrait. And from the perspective of 2020, 2021, I guess I was looking at those things in 2019, probably. What you see there is the whole scope of Dylan's career being outlined basically in the idea of self-portrait, uh, where Dylan's going through and just making lists of songs that have mattered to him. Like these are the songs that he think has, thinks has helped inform him as a musician. And they, they include songs from the American Songbook and includes gospel and um, and soul music of various kinds, R&B, as well as the things we'd expect, and, the, and some of which made it on that album, the blues, but lots of country crooner songs, Hank Snow songs. Right? There's this Dylan sort of mulling through his own musical history there on Self Portrait. You know, were the songs always recorded really well on Self Portrait? No, but I do think that that album was Dylan sort of saying, I'm not any one of these things. I'm not a folk artist. I'm not a rock star. I'm not a country star. I'm an American music performer. And to understand American music, you need all of this. And so to understand me, that's what my self-portrait will look like. And I, you know, I think it's fair. Like someone, even someone like Real Marcus, who I have, I, is a towering figure in uh, in American popular music criticism. I think he's he's one of the most interesting minds to to listen alongside of the most interesting set of ears that you get to inhabit when he listens to an album for you. As he said, I mean, he 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 missed it. He wanted Dylan to be a thing, and that's. That's probably the worst mistake any listener can make is to say, ah, I've got Dylan. He's this, he's a rock star. And how could he possibly release self-portrait? This is not what I wanted him to be. And that Dylan's absolutely like, he's like, I don't want to be what you want me to be. I want to be what I want to be. And sometimes, as you said, Charlie, that's going to mean a missed note. And my buttons are famously going to rattle against the guitar in some recording sessions. But you hear me therefore making music. You don't hear the slickness of a, of a, of a studio production, right? Everything doesn't feel managed. Anyway, any pop song today is so incredibly slick and managed and perfect. Like it's just perfect to listen to any contemporary album. And I, so I love the messiness sometimes of Dylan's recording series. It feels like a person is making a song mm -hmm. with you and not just having it manufactured for you. Well, self four has certainly defied expectations and it, when, when Dylan said afterwards it was a joke, I don't know whether to believe that or not. <laughs> but, you know, it's you know, talking about Dylan's knowledge about music. It, nowadays, with YouTube, if anybody wants to find out about any kind of music that's ever been recorded, you just go to YouTube and the entire 
planet is right there in front of you. But when Dylan was growing up in the 50s and 60s, that wasn't the case. You really had to seek out different kinds of music. It was hard to get. It was often out of print. He's in a little town in northern Minnesota where there, you know, there was not a Sam Goody's record store around the corner. So for him to accumulate all that knowledge, that's really an accomplishment. Uh, whether you like the music that he was picking up on or not, uh, this was a very serious guy, a very intelligent guy, but a very serious guy who went out of his way to, to hear as much as he could, even when it was very, very difficult to do that when he was growing up. Even in New York, when he got there, I mean, you, he didn't have money to go out and buy things. And as I said, a lot of those, that music was out of print, but he sought it out and found it and, and look what he did with it. Yeah, I think that's, you know, I, I love that about him, actually. And one of my one of my favorite Dylan projects, as you said, you can because of the Internet uh, and Dylan's always been responsive, I think, to changes in musical technology. Uh, and he makes with Sirius Radio uh, at the turn of the century, the most recent turn of the century, the, the theme time radio hour, which is basically, I think, self-portrait but expanded into basically a year to two years worth uh, of weekly radio shows where Dylan, Charlie, you were talking earlier about his humor. He plays a fake DJ, right? And it's, he comes on and he plays songs and every show is built around a theme like mother or baseball or smoking or whiskey or whatever it might be. And he basically takes you through a sort of history of American song around whatever that theme might be, but does it in this kind of fake jokey, DJ sort of way. He reads fake fan letters to himself uh, that that he puts on the air. And I still consider Theme Time Radio Hour to be one of the greatest seminars in the sort of history of American music that you could probably take. It's better than anything you can get in a university. Just let Dylan take you through the ways in which themes like that can cut through American history and you can hear all the different ways the music is in dialogue with itself, that this tradition is constantly talking to itself across what we think of as the barriers of genre, right? The genres are things we make to, to get in the way of music. I think one of Dylan's accomplishments as an artist and performer is he just doesn't think generically. That is, he doesn't think this is a country song and that's a pop song and that's a folk song. Um, he thinks these are songs and they're best when they're in conversation with one another. Uh, we don't need barriers or radio formats to tell us, don't listen to this, it's on the wrong station on your radio. And Theme Time Radio Hour does an amazing job of pulling that together. And I think creating, I think the ultimate aim was for Dylan to recreate his own experience as a kid, which he's described uh, in Chronicles of listening to the radio, of being able to skip down the dial and hear Hank, Hank Snow and, and uh, you know, and hear the crooners uh, sort of during the day. And then because of the way AM radio works at night, as he said, you can, as we know, you still, you can tune in the dial and those AM signals bounce off the atmosphere and you can, he was picking up R&B and blues songs from uh, from Arkansas, from high powered transmitters in Arkansas and the deep South that introduced him to the American blues. And he was hearing these two things alongside one another as American music and his genius, I think, as a writer, songwriter, performer is hearing the hearing how these things fit together rather than hearing them as things that had to be kept apart. I think you're right. And it's interesting in another way because the way radio has changed over the years, you know, I have things like the Beatles channel. I love the Beatles, but uh, do I want to hear only the Beatles on the channel? Do I have to turn the channel to find a different kind of music? Um, the term is narrow casting. Uh, you know, unlike 50 or 60 years ago, when I was a little boy in the early 60s, I could turn on the, the AM radio station and I'd hear maybe the Beach Boys and then Jerry Lee Lewis and then Perry Como. You know, in retrospect, it makes no sense at all. But as you say, Dylan thinks music is music. And I, my hat's off to him for that. And I, to me, it's a great reaction against and he may not have intended it this way. It's a great reaction against the narrow casting that we hear today. You turn on a station and you hear either one artist or one kind of music and that's it. I think that's, uh, I don't think that's good. You know, broaden your horizons, listen to some things that are different. I mean, a lot of the things that, that all of us hated when we were 10 years old, maybe we like them now. And I think Dylan is sensitive to that. 
Yeah, I think that's right. I, I mean, it's funny that you said I just I recently got a new car. So of course, you get like the three month satellite radio package where I could come across like, yeah, there's a Bruce Springsteen channel, there's a Tom Petty channel, right? There's a and man does it it does seem really narrow like who the only one that I was happy to listen to all the time was a Grateful Dead channel because they were just playing live versions of the dead and like, like Dylan the dead or this group that it might take you 10 minutes to realize you're listening to, to you know, to a, a familiar Grateful Dead song. Um, but I, 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 I think you're absolutely right. And it's one of the things that makes Dylan interesting as an historical figure that he can be this towering star and never really have fit well with format radio. It, that Dylan's never fit well on the radio. His songs were made popular by people who took them and fit them on the radio, right? The birds heard in Mr. Tambourine Man, a rock song that then fit perfectly onto the radio. And like when I was growing up, when you listened to classic rock station and Mr. Tambourine Man came on, it was the bird singing that song. It was never Bob Dylan singing that yeah. song. No. Uh, and that is, it, it's amazing that Dylan could have, can maintain a successful career over 60 years of recording music and always have been at odds with the radio format. Like I, even now, where would you put Bob Dylan on the radio dial? Well, exactly. I mean, he, he doesn't quite fit in anywhere. Um, I, I suppose he could play him you could conceivably play him on some country stations, but at the same time, no, he he, yeah. he just wouldn't he just wouldn't work. Uh, he he's really his he's his own genre, and and the ironic thing is that especially in the '60s and '70s, there were tons of people imitating him, trying to sound like him, patterning their songs after him. Um, I mean, Eric Anderson who unfairly, I think, is called a, you know, another Dylan. But at one point, he had an album that was an acoustic album. It was just him. Then Dylan hit, and he went back in the studio and re-recorded the album with like a Rolling Stones-styled backup. I, mean, that's, I don't know if anybody else ever did that. But he, um, in spite of the fact that so many people have, have imitated him, imitated his sound, he is still his own genre to me. Nobody quite captured it. Yeah, I think that's right. And it's it's one of the things that I think drives people a little crazy sometimes about him too, and gives us this sense, sense of Dylan being mysterious. Like, and I'll, I'll say this from like, even from my, from my vantage where I, I thought I was getting a handle on Dylan. And then he started releasing all those covers of crooner albums, you know, triplicate and so on. And that is one path I struggled to follow him down. Now, there's a great essay in the book, I will say, by a, an expert in the American Songbook who writes a beautiful essay about why these Dylan, why these albums are important and what Dylan was actually doing with them. Um, but I love that. Like, where, where, like, imagine making a whole album like that that is clearly never going to find a single radio station on which you could ever play any one of those songs. They would just, they wouldn't exist. Uh, and I, you know, I think the same is true of the songs on Murder on uh, or, sorry on Rough and Rowdy Ways, the most recent album that he re recorded. And I, it's it's because I think ultimately Dylan is a songwriter. He's chasing the sound. He's chasing the music in his head, and he's going to follow it wherever it goes. And because of his early success, I think he therefore has the freedom to do this. And to his great credit, never let go of that freedom and saw it as an, an essential part of what his creative process could be. Uh, and and has often, you know, as I said earlier, like Dylan's songs are made famous rarely by Dylan, but rather by those who hear something else in them. And Peter, Paul, and Mary can therefore record, you know, uh, "Blowing in the Wind" and transform that song into a into a number one hit. Uh, and I mean, I'll tell you this: so when I when I first when we certain shortly after we got the Dylan archive. Uh, but had not been publicly announced. My university president brought me in and said, among other things, we need to look, no, like we need to know, like we look what we're doing. Sorry. We need to look like we know what we're doing. So we need you to start teaching a course on Dylan if you can, so that when we announce the acquisition of the archive, we say, look, we're, we're offering a course in Bob Dylan at the university, even now. Uh, so I agreed to hurriedly put together this course and thought I'd put together a beautiful, uh, first day of the course, we were going to talk about blowing in the wind. Uh, I, 30 eager undergraduates who'd signed up for a Bob Dylan course and uh, had, or no, sorry, we we're going to talk about Tangled Up in Blue as a way of getting at all of Dylan's complicated music. And so we came, I came out on the first day uh, and we started this little exercise and clearly none of them had ever heard Tangled Up in Blue before, didn't know the song. 
I was like, okay, I need to hastily reinvent my, <laughs> my agenda for the day. Fine, we'll fall back to blowing in the wind. Everybody's heard of that. We can at least do that, right? So let's get going. Silence. Nobody knows blown in the wind except for one intrepid undergraduate who raised her hand in the back and said, oh, I know that song, Professor, but I think that's by Peter, Paul, and Mary. I don't think that's by Bob Dylan. My grandparents had that. And so, you know, I'm like dizzy and confused. Like, what am I going to do? <laughs> I don't even know who these people are. Uh, so I sent everyone home. I said, I'm, I can't teach this first day. Uh, so we'll, we'll reinvent. I want you to go home. Trust me, you know Bob Dylan. I want you to go home and, and Google your favorite recording artist and Bob Dylan. And I guarantee you, you'll find them having covered a Bob Dylan song. So I want you to just come back and talk about that next time. And sure enough, next time 30 people come back, they've all found, oh, you know, Adele, that Adele song wasn't Adele's song. That was a Bob Dylan song. I can't believe it. And, and it, that, that, that from there, the course was a huge success. Uh, so Dylan's important, not just, I think, as a performer and so on, but but what an exercise like that reveals is Dylan is also a songwriter's songwriter, right? That yeah. he's just shaped the way we make popular music in ways that we probably forget because it's almost an invisible part of the DNA of how popular music gets made. Well, there's so much competition out there now, and yet, and yet, when he puts out a new album, it's a very big deal to an awful lot of people. You know, there's still a lot of people who don't, have any idea who he is, but still, it uh, it's it's an event when there's a new Bob Dylan album. Yeah, and I believe this is the first. This is the first of his. I'm not going to have the exact. Uh, somebody in the audience may remember this. I think this was Dylan's first number one release uh, because of the way it was a category that didn't exist, but it was number one digital release when it came out uh, on Spotify. But it was the first time a Dylan. I think it was the first time a Dylan single hit number one. And it took him to his very last album. It was Murder Most Foul. And it took his very last, you know, like this album that he made when he was 80 years old or 79 years old to finally get to number one in the chart, despite the fact that this is clearly the single most influential songwriter in American history. I think it's probably time for us to go to questions. If the Athenaeum can uh, agree with that. We agree. We've got some questions <laughs> here. Um, how about if I read them out and then you guys can decide um, if you want to answer them both or singly. Sure. Um, so someone wants to know if either one of you have met Dylan. I have not. I have okay. not either. I don't, I don't expect to meet Dylan. I, he's a very odd guy and I suspect he wants to remain largely unaware of what I do <laughs> as a scholar. <laughs> Um, and then this person has also been carefully studying your background, Sean. <laughs> so um, is asking, what are the objects on the desk and the wall? And are there any stories to the Dylan photo in parenthesis? It says yellow submarine. So I think oh, it's- Yeah, I've got my yellow submarine up there on the shelf. Yeah, yeah uh, no, there's no story to anything here. Uh, I mean, the poster, let's see if I can get my fingers right. <laughs> that poster uh, is uh, that was a, that was an that's an image of Dylan in a diner somewhere in New England actually um, I think somewhere in Massachusetts or maybe Western New York I don't recall uh, and that was actually the image that we were able to use for the World of Bob Dylan conference which is the very first conference that we held here when we opened the when we opened the the institute uh, and yeah I, I'd pull it forward if I could but you can Google this image too just go Google the Institute you'll find the image on our web pages uh it's an amazing picture of him in a, a kind of clam shack uh uh diner and we've cropped the image a bit so it's just Dylan but the uncropped image for whatever reason that the, there's a bathroom door behind him and there's a guy behind him in the bathroom kneeling over the toilet and so the, the image as a whole is astonishing but we decided to go just with this branding image so if you want a good story about that image is there's a piece of it that's off screen that's far more interesting actually than the dylan picture itself somehow that just kind of fits into your whole conversation this <laughs> evening about how dylan always defies expectation um so let's see, Daniel has a question, wants to know, are there specific musicians over the years who Dylan really respected, liked to work with, admired and sought out? Well, certainly the band, uh, he did a lot of recording with them, but um, uh, if you look at um, 
this is kind of a simplistic answer. If you look at, at the credits on his albums, you will see uh, some of the same names coming up at certain periods of time. Uh, he worked with, with Charlie Sexton, for example, uh, more than once. Uh, when he first went electric, it was the same gang of uh, Nashville studio musicians he was recording with on, on Blonde on Blonde and some of the same folks on Nashville Skyline. Um, but he doesn't stick with the same people all the time, which is one reason his, his catalog is so rich. Yeah, I think he's always looking for people that will try new sounds. And uh, so, I mean, as you said, I mean, I think the interesting thing is, as you're saying, Charlie, about that Nashville era is he does want to play with those Nashville cats, right? Like these, this legendary group of recording artists in Nashville, um, you know, that, that worked very much on the sort of studio production line. You bring in the star, they're much better than the star's actual band. So they'll play in place of the band and they just know how to churn out a song yeah. and, and make it perfect and professional and be done also because they're working union hours in a very efficient way. That's not going to make the record too expensive to produce. So they were completely blown away when Dylan shows up and is like just wandering around the studio, wasting hours and hours and hours of everyone's time, kind of writing in the studio, typing at the piano, you know, like writing at the piano. They didn't know what to do with themselves. They were, happy they were getting paid for doing nothing uh essentially uh but uh you know uh, that so that's an example i think of dylan like yeah working with this really interesting group and he worked with them both on the rock album and then afterward when yes. he went back to nashville as well like so, so even though we think of this as this huge transformative moment in dylan's sound he's actually got some of the same collaborators on both sides uh and from my view dylan you know dylan uh, People hate self-portrait. The other thing people say they absolutely hate about Dylan is Dylan and the Dead, uh, right? This this album that for whatever reason there was even supposedly, uh, I'll have to remember exactly where I got this information, but I know it's accurate. Uh, Dylan wanted to join the Dead uh, in the eighties and uh, the band held a vote, a, a silent, a secret vote. Uh, and it had to be unanimous, unanimous for Dylan to, to join the, the Dead and someone in the dead voted against Dylan, one of them voted against Dylan joining. And so Dylan didn't end up actually, which I, this alternative history that I want to write where Dylan becomes a member of the Grateful Dead sometime around 1988 and starts touring with them is weird and wild. And I just can't help but speculate about that. Uh, but, you know, but I think, but Robert Hunter, the lyricist for the dead in particular, Dylan has co-credits with him on a lot, a lot of co-writing credits with him on songs from around that era. And Mark Knopfler from Dire Straits, Dylan records what I think is his greatest single song with Mark Knopfler producing him um, and and playing guitar. Uh, uh, the uh, it's it's I, so I yeah I think Dylan does have these people that he latches onto and then is very happy to move on to unsettle himself and see what else might happen. This is a little bit of a related question um, and asked to what extent did Jacques Levy co-write with Dylan? Was there a co-writer involved during the Infidel album? Uh, he worked with them on, on Desire. I know that uh, quite a bit. Uh, Infidels, uh, Sean, I'm not sure about that. I don't know if he had co-writing. I'd have to go back and look. I mean, Infidel, the Infidels era was when he was working with Knopfler. Knopfler was brought in as producer for that album. Uh, I don't know if he, I'd have to go back and actually check the liner notes. Um, I don't think he credited anybody as a co-writer on that album. Um, but he was, as I said, he was worried. I mean, that's when he, that's when he writes and records Blind Willie McTell, which he doesn't release for another 10 years. Um, but, but Knopfler was clearly important in creating the sound of that album, but I don't think as a co-writer for any of the songs. Yeah. Johnny says no. And I would trust him. Um, and we have a couple of questions about um, Dylan as a performer. So Lauren says, I attended a Dylan outdoor concert in Rochester, New York in 2006. He was on the stage for a long time, but he never looked at the audience, not once. Any thoughts on why he comported himself in this fashion? Well, I think he's done that for a very, very long time. And I'll let me tell a short story that goes back to a previous question. Um, in 1965, he had an electric band behind him at Newport. And it was some guys from the Paul Butterfield Band and some, some other folks. And I saw Dylan that fall, that October, uh, in, in Worcester, Massachusetts. And the first half of the show was just Dylan himself. 
and he didn't open his mouth. He didn't say what he was going to sing. He didn't say thank you to the applause. He just got out and is saying, and then he walked off after about 45 minutes. Uh, 10 minutes later, the curtains parted, and there he is with a with the group behind him. Now, this is 1965. There were five guys there. They had on dark suits, white shirts, neckties. Their hair was greased back. Uh, they looked like juvenile delinquents with, with suits. And I thought, what is this? <laughs> Where did he find these guys? Well, then they started to play and they were absolutely fabulous. I mean, they, they looked as if they'd be terrible, but they were fabulous. Well, that was the band before they were known as the band. And they hadn't let their hair grow out and they hadn't grown beards and, and all that stuff. But it was, except for the drummer, it was, a, it was a different drummer, but it was the band. And Dylan, he didn't come out in a suit with slick back hair, but he thought these guys know how to play and I'm gonna have them play behind me. And if people are freaked out by their parents, so what? And he was right, they were fabulous. And he still didn't say anything from the stage during the, the, part, the electric part of that show. He, he just doesn't do it, I guess. Yeah, I think I'm, there, there's a critic named Richard Thomas who wrote a book called Why Dylan Matters, a Harvard classicist, actually. And so his tastes run a bit to highbrow, but basically has compared Dylan's performances to Shakespearean ones. That, And if you see Dylan's stages now, in particular, they ten, he tends to perform in a kind of black box style theater. So everything's usually very dimly lit. There might be a few spotlights um, ringing it. Sometimes there are these weird mannequins. Um, but it's the it, Thomas's argument is this is deliberate that Shakespeare, that Dylan is very interested in Shakespeare and always has been is is literally sort of setting this up as a kind of Shakespearean performance that just like the actor would not stop in the middle of a role of playing Romeo or something in a play to talk to the audience say great to have you all here tonight you're right I have to go uh stab myself in the heart or whatever take poison uh that Dylan's not going to do that that he's playing the role of Bob Dylan as he walks on stage and to do anything else to stop and say love you Tulsa or whatever it might be would be to sort of break the performance of Dylan-ness uh, and and thus that's one of the reasons that he doesn't really engage with the audience is that he's performing the role of Bob Dylan for you he's not Bob Dylan performing for you. It reminds me of the cover of the album Hard Rain which was recorded during the Rolling Thunder review and there's Dylan on the cover with white pancake pancake makeup all over his face. Yeah. Yeah, there was a, that was recently released as a film on Netflix, wasn't it? That, that tour. The Martin Scorsese movie? Yeah. Yeah, I haven't seen that, but apparently that's fiction and nonfiction in the same movie. Have you seen that, Sean? Oh yeah, it's astonishing. And I, I saw it, I was at the premiere and we had Ratso Sloman from this Rolling Stone there, uh, who was covering the tour at the time. And was playing along with the damn joke like it took me in so i'm sitting in the audience i think i know a lot about bob dylan and that movie as it premieres has these sort of weird stories like sharon stone was there and like dylan met her and she was wearing a kiss t-shirt and all kinds of weird anecdotes and this this some a couple of totally invented characters a producer for the show that didn't actually exist and uh and I was like, oh, this is all amazing new information. Like, oh, Scorsese's made another amazing documentary about Dylan. And during the Q&A with, with Razzo, he carried on the joke for a while. And then it quickly became clear that a lot of that movie was actually fictional. It was a sort of, it was, I don't know, a, 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 an ironic take on the original No Direction Home, the original sort of Scorsese documentary about Bob Dylan. He wasn't going to give you the same thing twice. So this was not a follow-up to No Direction Home. This was, as Charlie said, this is Dylan sort of undercutting the idea that the documentary is going to give you the real Bob Dylan, right? The, the whole documentary was set to sort of stand up those expectations and then undermine them uh, at the same time. But the performances in the documentary, you can ignore the narrative if you're not, if you're not, if you don't find the joke funny, just watch the performances because that's the gold of the documentary is Dylan on stage on Rolling Thunder Card Rain's not a great album in terms of capturing the energy of that tour, I think, but man, watching him perform with basically all his old friends, all who made him famous by covering his songs, watching him jam with them is a real treat. And so I have kind of a related question to that a little bit. Um, 
someone makes the point that he that Dylan has had over 3,700 concerts, and you know, is there a plan or a strategy for somehow conveying that large body of work to um, to people and new audiences? Like, how do you how do you capture that? <laughs> well. There's a whole industry of people who tape Dylan conference, uh, Dylan performances, right? Uh, and and these giant taping archives exist. Before there was a Bob Dylan archive, there was the Mitch Blank's apartment in New York. Mitch Blank is a guy that's gathered almost every single concert recordings. And these guys, they trade these things back and forth, you know, like I'll give you two Zurich 1974s for a, you know, a Toledo uh, 1986 or whatever. I don't, I mean, I'm making up these kind of, you know, how rare they each might be, but there's this whole group of people that trade these tapes back and forth. So before there was anything like the Bob Dylan archive we have now, there was the, these informal archives, right? Or at least non-professional archives that existed outside of, of academia or outside of Dylan's own control. Dylan's, I think, group has always existed at a slight agonized relationship to them. He knows they have these materials. They were all illegally sort of taped. Uh, sometimes sold, but that that's where all of those 3,700 or concerts are. And I believe all of that material is going to be making its way to the Dylan, to the Dylan center here, that the, the tape, they've reached an agreement with the tapers where you will be able to hear all that. Eventually it'll be digitized and, and preserved. Um, that's and, amazing. But it's all down to these guys that literally had to sneak in cameras and microphones and recording equipment. It's not like, now it's your phone, right? This wasn't an easy thing to go sneak in and record a Dylan concert in 1967. Um, so it, it, that is an amazing thing, I think, um, that that will be preserved and uh, and gives us a whole other catalog of material to listen to and work through. Yeah. Especially important in Dylan's case, because he's, as we've talked about, he changes his arrangements so often. So who knows how many different arrangements he might have of a particular song over a period of 30, 40, 50 years. And when you go to Dylan's website, if you haven't been there, go to bobdylan.com. One thing that they do do on that website is track the number of times he's performed every song and at what concert. So you can actually go through all those 3,700 performances and say, how many times has he performed actually like Rolling Stone, like a Rolling Stone and when? And so you get this sense of this map almost of how Dylan's moved from one song to another why a song will show up in his repertoire in the 1970s drop out for 20 years all of a sudden it's like being played night after night in 2010 or whatever that's it's a fascinating thing to just go see how dylan has revisited his own huge archive because when he goes and does these concerts he's often wandering back through his own catalog in all kinds of interesting ways and connecting something old with something new and rearranging something that uh you know from the middle of his career so it's that's an amazing sort of resource just to go fiddle around with and see what's Dylan performing this week and how is it different than what he did two years ago or five years ago or 20 years ago. Um, well, we have a book question, so I feel compelled as a librarian to ask it. Um, so Kevin is wondering if there will ever be a second volume of Chronicles in the future. <laughs> That's up to Bob Dylan, right? I agree. Uh, there's, there's, it's supposed, supposedly, uh, yes, but, you know, my understanding, uh, well, historically, we can say Dylan was going to write this one book. Actually, I have it here for some weird reason. Uh, Dylan's first book was called Tarantula. It's this kind of wild, surrealistic set of writings that was originally going to be published in 1967, I think didn't come out till much later. I know it didn't come out till much later because Dylan kind of abandoned the project. Uh, Chronicles is, is the next book. Uh, I think he loves the idea that we might be waiting for Chronicles volume two, especially since Chronicles one is a, is itself a, a wild mix of true and untrue things. And lots of scholars have been caught relying on Chronicles Volume 1 to tell a story about Dylan that turns out not to be true because Dylan has clearly invented the story and embedded it within Chronicles alongside some act, totally accurate and never before seen stuff. So Chronicles 2, I, he's not going to repeat himself, so we shouldn't think that Chronicles 2, even if it does come out, is going to look anything like Chronicles 1. It could be a graphic novel for all I know. I mean, <laughs> right? 
Um, and speaking of academic interest in Dylan, there's a couple questions. People are intrigued with the idea of um, people studying him and his, his influence on our culture. And so the question is, any idea how many college classes on Dylan taught around the country? And uh, could you elaborate on the specific of yours? Do you teach it every year? Um, for example, Richard Thomas at Harvard does a freshman seminar every four years. I mean, I would love to know the actual answer to the an accurate count of the question. I can say that when we hosted the Dylan, the first World of Dylan conference, with that one, what we did was just put out a call to scholars to say, "Do you, would you want to present a paper on Bob Dylan?" Who's and it, that gives you a sort of rough sense of who's actually doing scholarly work on Bob Dylan. And we had 250 scholars show up. I so I that and you know about about that many presentations at that conference. So you might be able to say that's that's one gauge of how broadly he's taught. Um, so I would I would say there are lots and lots and lots of college courses on Dylan, um, certainly in the hundreds around the country. Uh, now, and Dylan intersecting with a variety of other things. So it might be a course on Dylan and the Beatles or, you know, or music of the 1960s. So it depends on how you cut that pie sometimes. Um, as far as my course, I've, I, teach, I teach in a variety of different formats. I teach I teach a course that's just on Dylan um, for undergrad, sort of an upper level undergraduate course where we would treat it like a course on Dickens or James Joyce or something like that. Uh, at the graduate level, I teach a course on Woody Guthrie and Bob Dylan that lets students go and actually use the archival materials um, and see those two writers in, in conversation with one another. Uh, and then I teach another course called The Politics of Pop where Dylan is the sort of founding example of a kind of political figure using popular music and then we we carry that all the way up through the present day, Black Lives Matter songs and so on. So uh, popular music, I think, is becoming it, it's an it's an interesting thing. There's no such thing as a department of popular music at nearly any university. And it falls it falls between lots of different academic disciplines. Lots of music departments don't necessarily have a huge interest in pop music because they tend to be classically oriented or or, or performance oriented. Uh, English departments have long been the home of Dylan and, and others, uh, just because of Dylan's poetic sensibilities and because pop music in general is sort of plays the cultural role that poetry played before recorded sound in, the, in American culture, as it kind of used to be people could just recite poems uh, before the era of recorded sound because we had magazines and you could read them and learn them. And that was how we how we preserved that that kind of art form. Now we hear it on the radio and can recite lyrics. You know, I, my daughters are far more sophisticated students of poetry, I think, than, than Hawthorne or whatever may have been in the 19th century, just because they're exposed to so much more poetry. You turn on the radio, you have poetry blasted at you all day, every day, if you want. Uh, it's not the way it used to work. So because of that change, I think, uh, you know, popular music gets taught in all kinds of different classes in all kinds of different ways. So I, I suspect you'd be hard pressed to find a university that didn't offer at least some way of some course that was on popular music, maybe not always Dylan, but Dylan's always going to be in that conversation just and now, especially because of the Nobel Prize, it's it's an easy argument to win with even the most rigorous gatekeepers. You know? And I find it interesting that you had 30 students sign up and yet they weren't familiar with his music. So what do you think attracted them to the class? Their parents. <laughs> uh, when I asked them, why are you here? I asked that question. What in the world are you doing then? Um, <laughs> you know, and some of them said, my brother, one said, I remember memorably, my brother would kill me if I didn't take this class. Um, a couple of others said, my parents saw this and took it. And of course, we're used to be hearing parents don't want you to be English majors. And, and if you do, they're going to go study this irrelevant stuff. And yet here I'm hearing stories of my parents want me to take the course on Bob Dylan, I guess, to come home and teach them about Bob Dylan or something. So, um, you know, he's, he's, he's a fabulous cultural figure. So I think he's a name to conjure with in the way that when I was in graduate school or when I was an undergraduate, I wanted to take a course on James Joyce. I didn't know anything about James Joyce other than that's what interesting people talked about James Joyce. So if you wanted to be an interesting person, right. you should probably know about it in a serious way. Or if you want to be a serious person, maybe rather than an interesting person, I suspect they feel the same way. They know Dylan somehow is a serious part of American culture, but they can't really say why and take a course like this, hoping they can Right. Say, say why at the end. Cool. Um, I have one clarifying question. Earlier in your conversation, you and Charlie mentioned a Ratso. And so someone's asking who Ratso is. 
Charlie, did you ever know him from your time at Rolling Stone? Uh, I did not. Uh, and I'm not sure exactly when he was there. He was there around, yeah, around that Rolling Stone era. I mean, he was a, he was a Rolling, he was a sort of uh, personality at Rolling Stone, uh, who music writer, critic followed Dylan around, I think, uh, and was himself a sort of, from what I understand, just made a general pain in the butt of himself um, in that kind of Rolling Stone reporter way. Like, it's not just about reporting on the rock stars, it's about living with them and experiencing the life. I, Charlie knows far more about the world of Rolling Stone than I than I ever will. So, uh, but he was definitely a personality, I could say. Great. Um, well, I think we have time for one more question. This one's, um, I don't know. I'd be curious to see how you answer it. Um, an anonymous person has asked, uh, what would either of you like to say to Dylan if you had the chance to meet him? You first. <laughs> I mean, honestly, it sounds completely hokey. If I had a chance to talk to him, one, I don't necessarily, I, I wouldn't, I'm not a journalist. I don't really have like journalistic, I don't need to know one pressing question about Dylan's life. So I would actually say something along the lines of, and however embarrassing it would be, like, thank you um, for, you know, the extraordinary work that you've done and for remaining actually true to whatever vision you might have that has made you such an interesting person. Uh, I, you know, I, I wouldn't, I don't have some cutting question that I need to know what happened in 1964, why he went electric or I, I'm a scholar. I don't, I'm not used to working on people who are still alive. Um, so I'd probably be totally embarrassed and awkward around him and could only mutter thanks and I love your music and I'm sure he would mutter whatever and <laughs> you know <laughs> move on to the next person. I, before I asked him anything myself, I would say, well, I'd be asking him myself, can I believe what he's about to tell me? <laughs> that's, you know, that's the unanswerable question, but um, work, working under the assumption that he would give me an honest answer, I would say, uh, what would you do differently if you could do it over again? Hmm. That's a good one. Yeah, absolutely. Especially for a guy who's 80 and has seen yeah. seen everything from all angles. I mean, that would be a fascinating actually, answer. Actually, there is there is something else I would ask, a more serious question. Um, he didn't single-handedly create folk rock. I mean, there were other people around at the same time, the birds most noticeably. Uh, and his producer, Tom Wilson, uh, had a, a role in this too. But I, I wonder about Dylan, the same thing I wonder about Miles Davis, who took jazz into electricity at about the same time and for the same record company, interestingly enough. Uh, I would say, how do you feel about that? I mean, if you hadn't done it, somebody else would have, but how do you feel about the fact that this acoustic tradition that had been around for hundreds of years and all of a sudden it's plugged in and it's largely your doing for better or for worse. How do you feel about that? I mean, I would think it would be something he would carry with him all of his life in good ways and bad ways, but I would love to hear his thoughts on that. All right. Well, who knows? Maybe someday it'll happen. <laughs> um, so that pretty much wraps it up for tonight. Do you, either one of you have any final questions for each other or final comments you'd like to share? I'd simply say it was a pleasure to be here. I enjoyed the opportunity and oh, how I wish I could be on Nantucket myself right now, but uh, uh, but it was uh, it was a great pleasure to be able to have this conversation, especially to meet, to meet Charlie and to spend an evening with you talking about Dylan. I'm always happy to do that. I would echo Sean's comments. Um, I think if Dylan were watching this, he would uh, roll his eyes at some of what we've said. <laughs> be impressed by some of what he said and maybe put his foot through his computer screen with some <laughs> other things he said. I, I, I see. I'm delighted to have done this. I, uh, it was great to meet Sean. Amy, thank you again for putting this together. This has been a wonderful time for all of us, I think. Yeah, it's Absolutely. been great. And thank you both for your time and your, your brain full of Dylan information. <laughs> of course. Um, okay, so that kind of wraps care. it up. I want to thank everybody for joining us and uh, for asking great questions and have a great evening. You too. Take care.
Goodbye, everyone.